Awesome. Awesome. Y'all ready for this? Man, let me just say this real fast. How incredible has our speakers been so far? Yeah? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Katie, right? Give it up for Katie. That was crazy. Man, and then we got Marcus. We got Clay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'll, I'll give everybody a chance. Then we got Marcus. <laughs> then we got Clay. You're going to hear from them again. You're going to hear from them again. We got Samuel. Bringing it. Bringing it. So here's the good news for me. This can fall flat, and I know you've already got enough. But here's the deal. Here's what I know. Um, Jesus, his word is powerful. All right? You know what I mean by that? Like you hear it, and it changes everything. And so here's the deal. We're going to hear a story um, that begins again, uh, or it ends where all things began for Peter. And so I'm crazy excited about getting into this. I'm crazy excited about talking about the life of Peter. Here's one reality that you're going to have to get, uh, give me a little grace on. My voice is going away. Uh, and I don't know why. Like when I was reading the verse earlier, I was like, is that my voice? Okay. <clears throat> so it's just one of those things. It's going away. And I was going to do a lot more screaming. And it's just going to, we'll see what I can do, okay. But here's the deal. There are three words that I want us all to remember. And, and so we're going to practice them. So they sink in. First word is eat. Everybody say eat. eat. You can do better. Eat. eat. All right, say feed. feed. And then follow. follow. I'm going to do them all three, and then you're going to do them. Okay, so don't jump in on me while I'm doing it. Eat. <laughs> all right. Eat, feed, follow. Eat, feed, follow. Eat, feed, follow. One more time. Eat, eat, All right, that's what, that's what we're going to be talking about. I'm excited about it. If you have a Bible, which you should, uh, let's go ahead and turn to John 21. And again, this is going to be one of those things for us. Let's get in uh, this story. Every time you read scripture, you're given an opportunity to enter into an actual story that happened. You put yourself in these pages, and then you begin to hear and see what Jesus is trying to teach you what he's trying to coach you on. And so the scene is the Sea of Galilee. And we have a picture uh, of, of the Sea of Galilee. So if you have a hard time picturing the sea, check this out. This is pretty amazing. And so we're going to leave that up for a minute because this is the scene that we need to step into. Because remember what's happened, right? Jesus called them and said, hey, guys, follow me. And Peter was like, I'm all in. And then he goes through his story where he proclaims Jesus you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, that is so true. God gave you that. Hold on to that. And then we keep going and we find out that Peter, even though he's confident, he still denies Christ. He, he fails to maintain this faith that he was so confident about. And then right after that, Jesus' life fails according to their perspective. And he goes away. But this morning... We learned that that wasn't the end of the story, right? Death can't hold Jesus. The grave can't hold Jesus. And so Peter, he, he, he felt two things. So he denied Christ, and he felt like a failure. And then he saw Jesus die, and his opportunity to be restored potentially died when he saw Jesus die on the cross. But now Jesus came back, and Jesus actually talked to him. Have you ever been in a situation uh, where your relationships are, you're like, I know I've got to go talk to them, and we've got to deal with this. Have you ever done something, and you know you've got to tell your dad? Like, there's a scratch on that car, and he's going to find it. So what do you do? Well, let me, just, let me help you out. If you don't know what to do, you tell him before he finds it, all right? That's just practical. That has nothing to do with the message. But if you do something like that, you tell your dad, and then grace comes with amazing responsibility for owning your mistakes. Okay, that's, that's, but Peter's in this tension right now where he's thinking, Jesus and I need to talk, but I don't know what to say. Like, I, I don't know how to enter into this conversation, okay? Many of us feel that. Many of us feel like we're Christians, but we've done things 
that have put us in a place where we don't know if we can move into the next phase. We don't know if we're good enough anymore. We don't know if Jesus wants to use us anymore. And so this story is for us. If you've ever been in that situation. So John 21, let's read the first few verses. Here's what it says. After this, okay, Jesus rose from the dead and he's been appearing to different people. He says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. So he's about to tell us this story of how he came back into the picture for a very specific reason. So here's what he says. Peter, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, the Canaan in Galilee, um, the sons of Zebedee, so that's James and John, and then you've got, uh, who else? And two others, <laughs> we don't know, just two guys. All right, and so they're all together, and Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Everybody say, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. That's what he says. And then they said to him, and we're going to go with you. Why? Because they knew how to fish. Let me just be real honest with you right now. Okay, here at camp, you're experiencing things. You're seeing Christ in, in like crazy real ways. You're seeing and experiencing a taste of what the church is supposed to be like. You love people beyond reason, okay? You care for people that you don't know. So you're experiencing and you're tasting the kind of kingdom that Jesus came to restore. So you're here and you're experiencing this, right? And then you leave here and all of us are going to be tempted to say what? I'm going fishing. Because faith was easy at camp. It made sense here. Things happened. I understood all these things. But when you get home and you're confronted with a friend that you know you have to part ways with. When you're confronted with a temptation and a sin that you thought you dealt with. When you're confronted with all these things, all of a sudden you realize this is a lot harder. I wish I was at camp, but all of a sudden I'm here now. And maybe that camp thing begins to become this memory of what was and all of a sudden one day you wake up and you say the same thing that Peter said he said I'm going fishing I don't know if this is worth it Jesus got the wrong guy what he told me then when he first said I'm choosing you to lead he got it wrong and some of us will be tempted to believe the same thing Some of us, when we leave here, will be tempted to believe, you know, Jesus showed me things at camp, but I think he got it wrong because I'm really good at fishing. But let me show you what happened, okay? So they go fishing, right? Then what does it say? They're all with them in the boat. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Everybody say nothing. Oh, come on. Say nothing. Nothing. They got back in the boat. They went fishing, they got back to the things that they knew, back to the things they were comfortable with, back to the things that they thought would satisfy them, back to the things that they thought were basing their identity on, back to the things that they knew they could do, and they caught what? Nothing. They didn't catch anything. That's how it's going to be for you. You're ruined because you've tasted the kingdom of God. And when you get back, you're going to be tempted to say, I'm going fishing. But when you go fishing, when you go back to the old way of life, you're not going to catch anything worth keeping. It's not going to satisfy you. Didn't work for Peter and them. And so what happens next? They're out on the boat. They've been fishing all night. And I know some of you, you've been uh, up all night. I remember, like, last night I heard there was, like, thunder in the dorms. And so there was, like, things happening I just heard it I did <laughs> there it was bad weather right <laughs> bad weather and so and so I know some of you know what it's like <laughs> all right come on and we're back <laughs> some of you know what it's like to be up all night and I know and all your leaders and all your friends around you know that dude was up all night you know why because you were a pain to deal with in the morning just to be honest, I'm up here and I can say what I want. So that works out for me. Um, and so, but you can tell. And so these disciples are all coming back in and they're like, man, I, 
can't fish anymore. I dropped the ball with Jesus. I can't, I can't do anything right. And so then they're coming back to shore because fishing at night, that's the thing to do. And they look up and they see a guy waving at him on the shore. They see a guy sitting there. It looks like he's got a little fire pit going on the shore of, of the Sea of Galilee. And, and they're looking at there. And he goes, hey, guys. He actually calls them children. Children, did you catch anything? You know, if Jesus was, like, messing with them, that would be really mean, <laughs> you know. Did you catch anything? Nope, I knew that. That would be, that'd be mean. He's not like that. He says, did you catch anything? They said, no. And he says, all right, well, why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat and see what happens. And all of a sudden, you could, you could feel it. Like, Peter's going, like, hold up a minute. John, who's, who's with him, says, whoa, 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 we've been here before. We, we've been in this spot before where we thought we knew what we could do. We thought we knew what we could bring to the table. And it was just not enough. It wasn't good enough. And then this guy shows up who doesn't fish, who teaches scripture. And so everybody knows pastors are weird. And so we don't really listen to those guys much. And so, but he shows up and he starts telling us about how to fish. And so this time they don't deny it. They go, they throw it over. And all of a sudden, what happens? They catch everything they couldn't catch. Even their old job with Christ was better than them doing it on their own. That's a different story. But so they throw their nets on the other side. They start catching all this fish. What does Peter do? Have you read the story? He puts on a cloak because apparently it was cool to fish naked back in the day. But that's a different part of it. So he puts on his cloak and he dives in because everybody knows you can't show up to Jesus on the shore without your stuff. Okay? So he jumps he swims, and all the guys, <laughs> they're sitting here with this catch of a lifetime again, and then they're bringing this stuff in, and Peter's like, I can't wait. I've been holding this in me. I've been holding this thing that says, I have got to have this conversation with Jesus. I've got to have my chance to get back with him and actually deal with the stuff that is just eating me up. And so he finally gets his chance, and he meets Jesus, and finally the other guys, they meet Jesus, and they find that he's been here's what's cool he teaches them he shows them how to catch the fish but jesus is already cooking fish he's already got fish on the grill he's got bread waiting for them and then look what he says pick up in verse 12 jesus said to them come and have breakfast come and have breakfast not now none of them None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. They've, they've been here before. They've experienced him before. They, they've gotten good at knowing when the Lord has showed up. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. Here's the deal. Here's the first thing that Jesus does. Here's the first thing that he wants everybody to understand. You come to him and he feeds you that's what happens first everybody say eat jesus said come and eat that's the first step in this if you want to be restored if you want to experience life with christ if you want to grow in your faith if you want to like, kind of live the kingdom life not the one that's stuck in the junk of our world but live eternally a kingdom life starting now then that means you start around a table with Jesus you know a little while ago um, my, my daughter I, again I've got three kids I, I told you guys that my youngest her name is Callie Jo and she is funny um, she, she's awesome she's number three and we thought number three was gonna be like really chill uh, but but turns out number three can also be like um, really aggressive like I've got one and two in my way and I'm gonna be one you know that's that's her mindset in everything so Bible reading time I've got my son my daughter and I'm reading the Bible and Callie Joe's the one who like climbs up under the Bible and sits in my lap and I'm like okay I mean she wins again so that's her all right she's always trying to figure out how do I do what my brothers and sister do they're older they're more independent how do I do these things how do I you know figure these things out so one day Callie Jo figured out how to get water out of our refrigerator. 
both my son and my daughter, they would go up to the refrigerator, they would fill up their cup with water, and they would be able to drink it. And Callie Jo had been trying and trying and do it. She was just too short. And one day she finally figured out how to get water out of the refrigerator. And I was like, Callie, that is awesome. Because one, one day she comes to me, she's like, Dad, she's got this cup, and she brings me this cup of water, and she's like, Dad, I, want, I brought you some water. And I was like, oh, this is good. And I smelled it because in my family, you got to smell everything. And so I smelled it. I'm like, all right, we're good. So I chugged it. I was like, baby, thank you. That is so awesome. Hey, can you give me another one? And so I, so I told my wife, Lindsay, I was like, hey, Lindsay, follow Callie just to watch how she, like, what is she doing to get up in the fridge? And so where we used to live, um, it, you know, you would, you would walk past the counter and you'd go right to the refrigerator. And so she would walk past the counter and she went left to the bathroom. Um, yeah. And so she followed her to the bathroom as she dipped the cup in the toilet. <laughs> Dad, I got you a, ni a nice cold cup of water. And I was like, are you serious? You brought me toilet water? And listen, I didn't even smell it. That's because my wife knows how to clean. Thank you. She's amazing. Um, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Listen, for so many of us, for so, let's get past the fact that I have a dirty mouth now. Um, for so many of us, we turn to things hoping they're going to satisfy, hoping they're going to quench a thirst. And turns out we've been drinking dirty water. So many of us run to relationships hoping they're going to satisfy us. They're going to give us the identity that we know. I mean, if I have this relationship with so-and-so, man, then I'll be cool. Or if I'm an athlete in this way and I'm doing these things, then I will have arrived. Or if I have these kinds of awards or if I'm on this part of this team. or the, So we, we run to broken um, means of drinking and eating. We go to all these different things thinking they're going to satisfy us, thinking they're going to be for our good, thinking they're going to finally give us what we need. All the while we've been drinking this dirty, nasty water that is killing us on the inside. And so Jesus from this story says, listen, if you want to have a faith, if you want to have a relationship, if you want to be satisfied in this life while you are on earth with a heart driven and hungering for eternity, then you have to meet me at the table. I have to feed you. Nothing else can feed you. If you're going to eat, he's the one who is the source. Nothing else will. So Jesus invites Peter to the fire pit. And he doesn't say, hey, Peter, let's deal with some things. What does he say? He says, eat. Eat. Then here, let's keep going. And then it goes on. Let's see where we are. Verse 15. Um, oh, and, and just a quick side note here. Um, the, the whole eating thing is all through scripture, Right? The whole thing about, you know, hungering for God, our hearts were created with eternity in them, and so everything on earth doesn't satisfy you. You know those passages? You know, even in Psalm 23, it says that Jesus hath prepared a table for you in the presence of my enemies. That means in the middle of your doubt, in the middle of the pain that you're going through, in the middle of some of these things, he says, oh, hold, hold, hold on, let's not miss this. I've prepared a table for you where you can eat with me and be satisfied. And it's just all through it. So as you read scripture, kind of go to that. Now, 15, here's where we go. Verse 15, here's what it says. Now when they had finished breakfast, because everybody knows breakfast is the most important meal of the day, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? All right. He's not saying do you love me more than you love those guys? He's not saying that. He's saying, are you committed to me like you said you were? Are you devoted? Are, do, do you actually love me more than these guys love me? Are, are you really living up to this thing that you're speaking with your mouth? Has your heart caught up to that? Do you love me more than these? And I love how Clay brought this point. He said there was a point where Peter followed 
at a distance. Do you remember that? I thought that was so brilliant because Peter said, I'm still committed, but from back here. And Jesus, he's restoring him, says, do you love me? It's like he's saying, do you love me here? Are you now committed to me here? He be he's beginning to bring Peter back in and say, this is where I'm asking you, do you love me? And then he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Everybody say feed. You have to eat first. He's the source. And then you can feed others, which is our mission. You eat first. He satisfies you. He fills you. Then you feed others. Our purpose. Our mission. But here's what's interesting. All right? We're going to get into some nerd moments for a second. He says, um, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? Agape. Everybody say agape. agape. Do you agape me? You know what that, that word means, love. Okay, that's the, one of the, there are four um, Greek words for love. Do you agape me more than these? And what does Peter say? He says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Everybody say phileo. The city, Philadelphia, the city of what? So this is interesting. Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you have a unconditional, sacrificial kind of love for me here? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know that I love you. And this is me kind of translating it. But I'm working on it. I'm not there yet. I'm still carrying some stuff. I'm still struggling to believe things about myself that you've said are true. So this is interesting. This, again, he says it three times, right? Peter denies Jesus three times. So Jesus is going to ask this question three times. So let's read it, and I'm going to show you the words that are used, okay? So here he says, first time, do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. And so then Jesus says a second time. He says, um, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Then he says, tend to my sheep. Feed my sheep, man. This is the mission. If, if you do love me, then, then this is the mission. And then he says to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Jesus met him where he was. How cool is that? Jesus met him where he was. He says, so do you phileo me? And at this point, Peter's a little broken up, and he's just like, oh, man. I can't believe we're at this place because this is breaking my heart. Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you. I'm, I'm kind of laid bare in front of you. you don't, I don't hide anything from you anymore. And so let me ask you a question. What was Peter's problem? And you can think about it. You don't have to answer because um, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, but So what was, what was Peter's problem? What was he dealing with? I think that Peter thought it was over. Not that Jesus was over, that, that he was over. He had messed up too much. He had made too many mistakes. He had done too much wrong. He had dropped the ball too much. Jesus was done with him, okay? I think he thought, I no longer have any purpose here. I don't actually have anything to bring to the table anymore. I've messed up too much. And Peter got something confused. He confused the difference between guilt versus shame, all right? Everybody in right now, up here. He confused the difference between guilt and shame. You see, guilt says, man, I made a mistake. Shame says, I am a mistake. You hear the difference? Guilt says, I messed up. Shame says, I'm messed up. I'm the mistake. And Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, Peter, you are not a mistake. I don't make mistakes. You are not a mistake. When I chose you, I chose you for a mission. I saw something in you that you don't see in yourself. You do not have this thing in you that says that I made a mistake because when I pulled you out of this sea fishing for men, I chose you to fish 
for men because that's what I needed you to do. I don't make mistakes. You are no mistake. You may have made mistakes in the past. You've got to let those go. But you are no mistake. You've got to let this shame go. Jesus, listen to me, when he died on the cross, he took your shame and he put it to death. You do not live under shame. In the beginning, in the garden, guess what happened? Adam and Eve brought sin into the garden and they felt what? Shame. And Jesus showed up on the cross and put to death what? Shame. You know, um, uh, this is, let me think about this. One of our kids was being born. I can't remember which one. I think it was Callie. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was a few years ago. And so um, she, was, she was being born. And so we live in Statesboro. We went to Savannah to have Callie. Uh, and, and, and so we left our other two with some friends. And so Callie was born, which was great. Everything went, went, went great. I mean, I say that. I didn't, I didn't do anything. I was just like, you got this. You know, that's what I, that was my part. Um, and so, so Callie was born, and we're leaving the hospital in Savannah. And our friend calls us and says, hey, uh, no big deal, um, but you need to meet us at the hospital in Statesboro. Because your son fell off of a chair and split his head open. It's not, it's not big. It's no big deal. Uh, but you should just meet us there when you get here. <laughs> you know, so we drove from the hospital in Savannah straight to the hospital in Statesboro, which I thought was awesome. And so I get there, and I'm looking at him, and I can see in his head. And I was like, don't freak out. Don't freak out. So, um, <laughs> So we're in the emergency room. It, it's been several hours now, and, and so he's exhausted. He's been crying. He's got blood all over his face. And so we now are moved to a room, and I sit on the bed, and then I hold him because I'm just, I mean, that's what, you know, as a dad, you're just like, I don't know what, I can't help you. Here, I'm just, this is what I'll do for you. And so I'm sitting on the bed. He's sitting on me, and I'm holding him. And, um, and as I'm holding him, he falls asleep. And when he falls asleep, the doctor comes in and says, hey, uh, we're ready to do the stitches. And so it's great that he's asleep. This is good. But just kind of hold on to him just in case he wakes up, okay? <clears throat> and so, so I'm holding him loving. And then I'm like, uh, just for extra measure, <laughs> you know. And so I'm holding on to this kid. And, and she starts to sew up his head. And he wakes up. And he freaks out. And I'm, I'm holding him with my arm and I'm holding his head against mine and I'm saying buddy it's gonna be okay man it's gonna be all right and he's screaming and he's fighting me and he's trying to get away and she's sewing as fast as she can I'm saying buddy it's gonna be all right you gotta sit here you've got to just hold on now where it's gonna be not any longer it just you can do this buddy and I'm just holding on and I'm like lady please hurry and so and I'm just like holding him and he's just this muscle of a little kid and he's like fighting and finally she cuts the needle off and she says okay we're done and I let go of him and he pushes me <laughs> because he blamed me for his pain I can't ever tell this story some of us look at God like he hurt us some of us look at God thinking he doesn't want us because I've hurt him and we've got the picture wrong because we're blaming him for stuff that we've done but he's been the one holding you so that you can get through your pain he's not the one who caused it he's the one who put your shame on the cross and then buried it. He's the one who says, you are not a mistake. You may have made mistakes. Someone may have made a mistake. You are no mistake. Your shame is gone. And as a father, he's been holding you the whole time through your pain so that you might be forgiven, so that you might finally be healed so that you might finally experience 
what he has for you. Some of you came in here looking at him the wrong way. He didn't cause the pain. He's holding you through it. Don't lose sight of that. So as we finish up, we, I've got 30 seconds, and it's not going to wrap up in 30 seconds. Um, at the end of the story, here's what he says. And after saying this, after saying, Peter, do you love me? You're not a mistake. You made a mistake. But here's your mission. I need you to feed my sheep. You eat, and then you feed. That's the invitation that he calls. Follow him. That's what he means when he says, follow me. Um, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer right here. Who likes bacon? Okay. Come on. <laughs> be, but be fast, because I'm already out of time. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Just want to show you here. Okay. We're reenacting Jesus, and, and I want you to have a seat right here. Jesus and Peter. I'm Jesus, by the way. You're Peter. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. And so here's just, I want to show you kind of what this looks like for me. So, can you confirm this is bacon? Yes. Okay. We actually have a microphone here. I'm going to give you this microphone. All right. So, Jesus says, Jesus says, I'm the source. And so, when, when you are ready to be satisfied, where do you come? To me. Now, please have a piece of bacon. Oh my God, this is heaven. <laughs> just one, though. Okay. I just want to point out the irony real fast as she's eating this, that we're eating bacon as we're talking about the story of Peter meeting Jesus. You can think about the irony if you want. Okay, thank you, Sam. Okay, now just real fast, describe the bacon for the rest of us. Um, tastes like pig. Amen. Um, it's not greasy. Well, it's like a little bit, but it's not like A little like greasy. Super greasy. It's a little greasy. We got a napkin. Okay, <clears throat> all right, here, I just want to show you something, all right, here, all right, you can put that back, actually, you just finish it, you can finish it, you can finish it, okay, here's, here's how, here's how shame and guilt work, you were a little disappointed that I said put it back, weren't you, <laughs> you're like, oh, thank you, all right, so, here's what guilt does, guilt says, I made a mistake, and so stand right, here, stand up real fast, stand over here, okay, stand, I want you to stand right here, guilt says, I made a mistake, and it wakes you up, and then Jesus says, have a seat, and then you come, and then, and then we deal with this, and then you're able to go do the mission, you eat, and then you go feed, you've got a friend, right, you have any friends, cool, I mean, that's a terrible question to ask, please <laughs> say yes, <laughs> if you don't, just say yes, and we'll make one right now, okay, okay, so here's what shame does, all right, don't fight me too strong because I'm not that strong. Okay, shame says, I need you to go feed my sheep. Now go get your friend. Don't fight me too hard. Okay, the point is, shame keeps you from doing the very thing that Jesus is inviting you to go do. Shame is the thing that keeps you locked here. When he's saying, go feed my sheep, and you're saying, I can't. I'm not good enough to do this. I can't get past this. Now, Let's assume we've dealt with our guilt and shame. Guilt brings us to the table, if you pay attention to it. Shame keeps you paralyzed from accomplishing the mission to feed the sheep. Now, do you have a friend who you think would like a piece of bacon? Yes. Okay, I would like you to grab a piece of bacon, put it right here, and then go take it to him. But I need you to be super fast, because people are going to be mad at me already. Go, hit hop speed. Get on it, get on it, get on it. <clears throat> Please don't hurt yourself. I didn't mean to, like, make it too urgent. So here's what's happening. So here's the mission. Go, wow, okay, you could have picked someone closer. That's cool. Um, okay, so, so, hey, eyes up here. Eyes up here, people. Okay, back up here, come on. So, Jesus says, eat, so you come and eat. And, and then I say, I can satisfy you. And then, and then the mission is, go feed. Do you think that same friend is hungry? Do you think they want more bacon? Okay, go take him another piece of bacon. Go, fast, get out of here. <clears throat> okay, okay, fast.
Faster, please. Faster, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I want you to hit pause right, right here at center stage. Right here at center stage. Okay. Is it a good thing that she is helping feed her friends? She's doing it wrong. What does a shepherd do to feed the sheep? The shepherd always leads the sheep to the source. Now, could you go get your friends and bring them to the table? And I do need both of you to hurry up. <clears throat> All right, have a seat right here. I'll give, you, I'll give you my seat. Okay, please have a piece of bacon. And you may not have another piece of bacon for all that exercise. And while you're eating that, I want to explain something. Listen, we eat from the source. But if you get caught up in carrying the responsibility of I've got to feed my friend, I've got to provide for them, I've got to do all these things, what's your friend supposed to think about you? You're my source. Problem is, you're broken and you're messed up. What you need to do is lead your friend to the source. What you need to do is you first meet Jesus and be satisfied in him. And then you go to feed your friends. You bring them to the table. You show them this is where the source is. Now, everybody in the room right now, if you want a piece of bacon right now, raise your hand. All right, you guys stand up real fast. I want to show you something. And we're going to end with, no, 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 leave your hands up. If you want a piece of bacon, leave your hands up. Can I show you something? Yeah, right here, right, both of you right here. Under your seat. I'm just kidding. There's not bacon. <laughs> oh, that was so mean. That was so mean. All right, if you want a piece of bacon, raise your hand. All right, shh. I need to land this point because I'm about to get fired. Okay. Thank you. This, I'm talking to you guys now. This is our world. Okay. If we could put our world in a room, this is what it would look like. Leave your hands up. Come on. Five seconds. Serious. Um, we, we, we say eternity was written on the hearts of every person. What that means is every single person is hungry. And the things in our world won't satisfy them. And so when you look out here, and you look at your schools, and you look at all these things, Jesus says, come to the source and eat, but look who you've got to feed. Everyone is hungry. Everybody needs him. Everybody must be satisfied in him. You can put your hands down. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. <clears throat> all right. We need to wrap this up. I'm so sorry. So repeat after me, eat, feed, that's what it means, okay, you can stop, thank you, that's what it means to follow. What does following Jesus look like? You meet him at the table and you eat and you are satisfied, and then you go feed your friends by leading them to the table. Do not let shame keep you from this mission. Shame was buried when Jesus was. The only difference is he rose and your shame did not. Okay? Don't carry that with you. Let's pray. Jesus.